Amen. Amen. Thank you. Praise God. Praise God. You may be seated. The title, thank you, worship team. The title of today's message is Just Learn to Hold Your Hand Up. Just learn to hold your hand up. I want to read to you Romans 15, verse 4. Romans 15, verse 4. I'm reading from the New King James Version. And it will be up on the screen as well. Verse 4. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning. That we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, may have hope. Now I've quoted this verse many times here in the services. But the reason that this verse is so incredibly important for every single one of our lives. Is because it shows us. That when this was written and the New Testament wasn't in existence yet. It was still in the process of being written by the apostles. This very moment he's referring back to the Old Testament stories. So he's writing to the churches. Those that have repented of their unbelief towards the Messiah. They have believed on Christ as the reason for the forgiveness of their sins. They have believed on Jesus to be enough for their acceptance. And, and here Paul writes to the Roman church that it is for you that these things were written. These things in the Old Testament for your learning. That through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, you may have hope. Now as today, we're going to look once again at a story in the Old Testament. We're going to look at the story about David and Goliath. And there's many things that we can learn from this story. But today it is my prayer that you learn together with me. What the Holy Spirit wants you to know. There's something the Lord wants you to know from this story. And that is the question that I pray we all ask in our hearts today. What does God want me to know from this Old Testament story? So that I can have hope and application for my own situation today. Since all of these things before were written... So that I may have hope. God, what do you want me to know from this story? So that I may have hope in my situation. We're going to look at the story of David and Goliath. As a kid, that was probably one of my favorite stories. Somewhere up there with the good part of the stories of Samson. I, I loved these, these hero stories. They always, I could dream about them. Play them out in my head. I could see them like a movie. I love them. But here we jump into the story of David and Goliath. At this point, the beginning of the story, the enemy now is invading the lives of the people of God. So the people of God are, if you will, in the right place. They have taken the grounds that were promised to them. But now the enemy is invading them in their territory. And this is an impressive enemy. This people have has been around way longer. They've been building their armies for way longer. They've been training and practicing for way longer. And Saul is king at this time. The first king. He has no impressive army. They have no impressive weapons. For a long time they had no weapons at all. All they had was literally sticks, pitchforks, whatever instruments they had for working the land. And the only one at one point that had a sword was Saul and his son Jonathan and still now they're very limited on their weaponry and they're if you will amongst the rest of the people they're very simple people they don't have a king that has a real palace so doesn't have a real palace yet they don't really look like the other peoples that have armies and you know can go to war either to conquer but in this case to defend and that's where we jump into the story in first Samuel Chapter 17. I want to read to you verse 4 and then verse 8 to 10 as well. Verse 4. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Geth, whose height was six cubits and a span. And then verse 8. 
9 and 10. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel. And he said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And you the servants of Saul. Choose a man for yourself. And let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me. And kill me. Then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him. Then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. So here we have this, this giant Goliath coming out from the army of the enemy. Coming forward already on, on the territory of what was Judah at the time. They've already invaded. And here this impressive man, impressive armory, impressive weapons. He cries out to see if there's anyone that possibly thinks they are a match to possibly defeat him. And he very clearly explains, if you do defeat me, we will become your servants. But if I defeat you, it's going to end up very different. He cries out to them, why have you even showed up here? Why have you come out to battle? Do you really think you're not going to have to give up this ground? You may have some temporal victory here, the Israelites, for, for a while, that that was their territory. But what he's really saying that, to them is you are going to end up being our servants in this very place. And the question today for you and I is, has the enemy in your life, since we're trying to find out what does God want us to know and how does God want to use this Old Testament story to teach us hope in our situation today. Has the enemy in your life ever made you feel that way? Where he makes you feel like, yes, you, you gained a little bit of ground for a moment, but why do you even show up for battle sooner or later? I'm going to take it right back. Who, what are you going to send forward? What are you going to do to keep this ground that you so wholeheartedly thought would be yours? Fight. Prove to me that you've changed. Prove that you're stronger now, that you can defend that ground. If God is with you, then wouldn't you win this fight by now already? And here comes David on the scene. And I'd love to be David, amen? I'd, I'd, my whole life growing up, I, I could dream about that. I'd be like David. And, and I'd love to be like David. But let's watch what happens. David comes on the scene, verse 34 to 36. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by the beard and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defiled the armies of the living God. What a confidence. What a courage. We know from the word he wasn't the biggest. He wasn't the strongest. The word says he was handsome. He had that going for him. But he wasn't very, uh, very impressive as a man. He wasn't the first you would pick out of his family for a fight. But what a confidence he's displaying. What a courage. He walks up to the king and he says, listen, we're going to win this. I'm going to have to go and I'll give you some reasons. I, I, I shepherd these little sheep and any time that a wild animal arose, I stepped right in there and I killed those things. This is also going to happen to this Philistine. I'm going to be able to do it. No one else in the army spoke like that. No one else seemed to have the valor and the might and the confidence like David did. And so David, first they, they, they try to you know, put all the armor on him. He says, this is not going to work. And, and he ends up going down to a brook and he grabs a couple of stones and takes him with him. And then David goes to face Goliath. 
And they exchange a couple of words from afar off and Goliath yells, I'm going to win. And David says, no, God has sent me for the victory. And then, and then David says this in verse 47. Then all the assembly will know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. And now Goliath gets up and David too and he runs towards him. And before Goliath can really do anything, David takes his sling and he, he throws one stone at Goliath and takes him down. Takes Goliath's own sword because David had nothing with him. Takes off his head and then we read verse 52 and 53. Now the man of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley and the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell along the road of Sharon, even as far as Gath and Ekron. Then the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines and they plundered their tents. Now remember how I said I'd love to be like David and I grew up wanting to be like David. Such a role model, if you will, especially for a man growing up. And, and I would imagine having some of David's skills, some of his courage, some of his, his fire, some of his desire for the honor of God. And, and, and I didn't want to be, when I would read or hear this story, I didn't want to be one among the armies that would just, you know, cower away or sit back to wait for somebody else to raise their hand and say, I think I can contribute to this fight. I didn't want to be amongst that army. An army that seemed to have no spine, no courage to step forward, nothing impressive. So who is this David in this story? You, learning for your own situation Today, who is this David? Let me read you verse 58. And Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? So David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse the Bethlehemite. So here David, he has conquered the victory. All of a sudden, the army, if you will, of failures has now conquered the Philistine camp, they have taken the spoils, they have pursued the enemy off their territory and beyond. And, and, and here Saul goes, David, who are you? And David answers him and he says, basically, I was born into serving and I have roots in Bethlehem. And you, church, have a very similar champion as well, one that came to serve one that has his roots in Bethlehem, the city of Davis, and you get to be among the unimpressive army. You get to be among the army of failures. You may be cower away from some of the fights or the battles that you've been facing. You may be too weak. So that all you can do is show up to watch. But you will overtake and you will plunder the camp of the enemy because you have a champion. Not because you find out or learn or muster up the strength to be like David. Not because you can gain strength and somehow make a way where there seems to be no way. No, we get to shout out to God together and say, Hallelujah, we have hope for failures. There's hope for those without courage. There's hope for those that are not strong enough. Hope for those that are too intimidated by the battle. You don't have to become like David. Being among the army of failures is enough for you to become victorious. You just have to learn to hold your hand up. Let me read to you again verse 47. Then all this assembly will know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear before, because the battle is the Lord's and he will give it into your hands. This is what the champion is going to accomplish for the assembly, for the army. He tells it right here. David says, listen, by the time I'm done, all of the assembly, everybody behind me, all of those that 
showed up. They wanted to be a part of the battle, but they just don't have it in them to win this one. They don't have it in them to protect that ground the enemy is trying to take. They don't have it in them to show the enemy they're strong enough now and grown up enough. They're not that much like David. And that champion said, then when I'm done, all the assembly will know that the Lord doesn't save with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give it into your hands. So remember the question, looking at the story, what does God want me to know? It's two things. I don't save by sword and spear. What that means is you don't have to be strong or skilled at fighting to become free from serving your enemy. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. It's not your battle. It's my battle. And I want to give the victory into your hands. But you need to learn to just hold your hands up. Fears. Autism. Perfectionism. Unforgiveness. Hurts and wounds. Sexual sin. A dirty mouth. A love for money. Pride and love for man-made religion. I had every single one of those in my life. And to me, they felt like Goliath. They would be screaming at me, if you will, and challenging me, trying to convince me that none of that ground I could ever conquer, protect, or win back. But when I finally repented of my unbelief and my hands were finally empty, God began to fill my hands with victory, not my victory, His. And He began one step at a time to fill my hands. But for a long time, they weren't empty. I want to invite you today to place everything on the altar just between you and God and empty your hands from all of the battles that you thought you have to fight, you thought you have to grow strong enough for, you thought you have to become victorious for, that you may empty your hands from every way that you thought you had to pick up a sword and a spare to, to, to chase the enemy off, to defend the ground that God wanted to give to you by his own works, by his own blood, to empty your hands that God may fill them simply because you have a champion. There will be victory in the camp of God given into the hands of those that have a servant champion right there from Bethlehem, just like the story mirrors us and seeks to explain to us really the story of Christ. Thank God I get to be a failure in God's camp. And if I'd only learn to just hold up my hands, He will fill them with His victory. If you're not sure today, if you belong to the camp of God, and you say, this sounds incredible. If I would just surrender all these things I thought I had to do, and I let God be God to me. I let God give me a servant champion into my life. Stopping to try to be good enough for God. Stopping to try to defend my own ground. Stopping to try to prove to God that I'm grateful enough for the cross. Stopping to try to show by my actions that I really do not love sin anymore. Proving something to God or something to the enemy. If you're not sure if you belong to the camp of God, just repent of your unbelief today. Today you can repent of your unbelief towards the one that says it is finished. I have paid for your sins. I have washed them away. I have made you white as snow. I have loved you from before the foundation of the world. But would you let go and would you 
learn to hold up your hand and let me give you my victory. If you would stand with me for a moment. If you're not 100% sure, if you belong to the camp of God, I'm going to lead you in prayer. And then secondly, if you are in need of victory today, I want to lead you in prayer as well. And you just got to learn to hold your hand up. Because Christ says that it is finished. But as long as we still seek to contribute or still believe, that our inability to fight the battle at hand somehow makes God frown on us or makes God disappointed in us. We still believe we have to be something other to be to totally accepted and approved. You are accepted into the army of failures. And if you would hold up your hand, God will give up his own victory. Lord, we come before you today and we thank you. God, that you have given us a servant champion from Bethlehem, Lord God, so that when we face a battle, when sin seeks to draw us, Lord God, over the edge once again, Lord God, when the enemy seeks to bring fear, confusion, doubt, pain, hurt, confusion, all these things into our minds and our lives again. When the enemy seeks to make us believe that we are supposed to win this fight. That we are supposed to be able to win and defend the very grounds that you purchased for us. Lord God, teach us in those moments to repent of our unbelief. God, you've never asked us to fight that battle. You've never asked us to become like David. You've never asked us to be strong in ourselves. You've never asked us to be able to deal with sin. You've never asked us to be able to change ourselves. You've asked us to not trust in what man can do, to not trust in a spear, to not trust in a sword, to not trust in what the hand of man could bring about, but to open our hands that you may give the victory unto us, Lord God. Every soul here today, every soul online, Lord God, if there is any doubt at all whether they are welcomed into the camp of failures, Lord God, I pray, that we may all choose today, Lord God, to repent of our doubts, to repent of our unbelief, Lord God, and to let today be the first day that we proclaim unto heaven, God, I believe that I am forgiven because of the cross. I believe that I am accepted into your camp because of the cross. God, my hands are empty. Fill my hands with your victory, God, today for your glory, for your ground, for your promises. Lord God, that you may have an army of hope, Lord God, not in our own strength, but because we have a champion given to us by Almighty God. For he desires his victory for his people that he may get all of the glory and all of the praise of all of our lives. God be glorified. God be honored in our weakness, Lord God. Take the battle from our hand and fill our hands, Lord God. We need you, Lord. We trust you at your word. And God, lead us, Lord, to the foot of the cross, Lord God, that that may be the place where we fight all of our battles, Lord. God, with empty hands lifted unto you, that you, Lord, may show us that you expect us to have empty hands. You don't expect more from us than to bring absolutely nothing. God, thank you that you will fill our life with victory for your glory. In Jesus' name. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't breathe in. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph Oh my God will never fail Oh my God will never fail I'm gonna see a victory 
You turn it for 